Hi everyone. Nice to see. <laughs> this is great. We all wave to each other. It's wonderful. We like uh, ships waving <laughs> from the deck. <laughs> Your beautiful, familiar faces. Very good. So uh, I don't know what are we doing. We're just sitting here for the moment, and uh, uh, about to start. I guess I should start my meditation pretty soon. I just wanted to sort of take you in, really. And uh, nice to have you here. Nice to be with you. Yeah. <laughs> just makes me happy and I laugh. <laughs> So, I'll start with the bell. This is a different bell because the big old temple bell has been packed to go away to the retreat, the um, session. And this is a, actually an older bell, really. It's alleged to be 17th century. It's very hard to, when you ask a bell, it just says bong. How old are you, bong? <laughs> so, <laughs> someone was traveling with the Dalai Lama when I was teach it, teaching um in an event that involved him, uh, sold it to me actually. So I have no idea whether it's as old as it says, but it sounds beautiful. So different temple bell. sound of the temple bell. Ah, very good. Just feeling the time, feeling what is, that which is. Feeling the, the meeting we're always having with the universe, with our own true face. So I'm just taking you in, taking in the time, feeling the time. So the, today we're talking about me. Okay. <laughs> Machines do things without consulting me. It's great, you know, I think. If my life lacks surprise and imagination, machines will provide it for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so thank you. So, I uh, guess this is a dark thing, dark matter, misunderstood matter for me. Uh, part of the, so the comment today, just to begin with, is past midnight before the moon rises. Past midnight, before the moon rises, when the third watch begins, so that's midnight, so it's just past midnight. Before the moon rises, an old moon, because it would have risen already if it were a new moon. And the Cohen goes on, 
but it's the beginning of it's a meeting come on so let's past midnight before the moon rises just let's just sit with that bit of it for a minute Just feeling it. What's it like to just, you know, show up in the moment and when you notice you're not really managing to just notice that and that's showing up in the moment. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So here we are. So what's happening here? It's a, having been, you know, very hot yesterday, over 100 degrees, and all the plants gasping. And then today, the sea fog came in, which is a blessed event in Northern California. And it's cool and restorative. What else is going on? It, it's a it's an interesting time. We we are all preparing to go into retreat. So on Monday, the next Sunday I won't be here because we'll all most of us will be in retreat, and we're having our fir an in person retreat, our first major in person retreat since the epidemic started, and um, uh, and so we had that experience of let's have an in person retreat. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> come on, we can do it. Oh, I don't know. So that, that kind of thing is going on inside everybody, uh, uh, of course, you know. And uh, uh, like John Joseph, who's, you know, often on this, in this event, is in Naples with COVID <laughs> and his wife. <laughs> so it, the chances are he'll be late to the retreat. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, and, I, and we have, um, anyway, we, we had a few people who are like data-based in science who work out protocols for us, so you know, what, what it takes if you've had COVID and coming to the retreat. And, um, and uh, it's very hard to guess where an epidemic will go, but this one just seems to get more enthusiastic. So, um, so the, the point about being at ease inside the questions and the anxiety is the whole point of the encounter. That's the encounter with Zen, you know. What you encounter is this. And so people have a tremendous amount of anxiety, and I thought, what to say about that? Um, that and all of us have a great deal of uncertainty. Should I do this or should I do that? And the answer is, the old Zen answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Which is great. But anyway, we've decided to do the retreat, and it's kind of fun and, and to be doing it and noticing how marvelous the people who are organizing it have been, you know, and uh, which is great to see. And so, so we're doing that, and uh, and when if you're not at the retreat, we'll be we'll be holding you in our hearts while we sit, and and we're also having the open temple is keeping going. So in some sense. The open temple becomes an annex of the retreat, and so if you want to join us, that's a way to do it, you know, uh, which is a kind of cool thing. So, so I think what I'd like to do is I want to go into the idea of an encounter, and the, the encounter. The encounter is a thing in Zen. I remember hearing endlessly from different teachers, particularly Kuhn, Yamada, and Robert Aitken, would say. Uh, Awakening is forgetting the self in the act of uniting with something. Um, and it all sounded kind of likely and plausible. It, and uh, knowing that didn't really help me at the time, <laughs> but uh, it probably did in a way, because those things that any, any, any piece of wisdom you get sort of somehow sinks in, even if you're not, not getting it at the, at the upper levels. Of your mind, so, so, in the act of uniting with something, uh, something I must have heard that I don't know, a lot, maybe a hundred times in my first couple of years of Zen, and uh, and I could see that if I just keep myself out of things, um, then I'm, uh, 
I'm here, and the universe then comes to meet me. There's another meeting saying in, in Zen that says, when the 10,000 things advance and meet you, that's enlightenment. When you chase out after to meet the 10,000 things, that's called delusion. It's not actually necessarily, you know, delusion is, I suppose, in the mind of the person who holds it. But, but if we can tell that when things we're here and things come to us, we're at peace in some way. And that's the true meeting. So, uh, so I want to sit with this that mysterious con that starts with our condition, really. Past midnight before the moon rises. That's our condition of wondering, you know, wondering about things. And every time you've got a doubt about something, ah, past midnight before the moon rises. So let's sit with that, okay? Ready, set, go. So let's just start with a bit of the darkness. Past midnight, before the moon rises, and the third watch begins, before the moon rises. Just feel that. You know, the moon's going to rise, but... And the darkness might be warm and helpful. You know? You're forgetting yourself already in the darkness. Not trying to order reality about all those things, you know. And you can feel that if you don't think it shouldn't be dark, then um, it's rather wonderful. You don't have to work things out because you can't. Which is always a good condition. <laughs> I always like that moment on a plane. Actually, now planes have good Wi-Fi, but before they had good Wi-Fi, where the doors closed and I couldn't do anything to control my life after that. And it was rather fun. It's so delicious. It's like falling asleep. So here we are. Past midnight, before the moon rises. Then the next part of the koan is past midnight before the moon rises don't think it's strange to meet but not recognize the other so you meet but do not recognize an old familiar face don't think it's strange to me to not recognize an old familiar face. So you don't recognize in the dark. And then the next line is, yet still somehow recall the beauty and the elegance of ancient days. So the whole of the gift of life is there, but we're not we're in proximity to it, but we're not sure of it. So I'd say that's the first stage of meeting, is to be meeting but not knowing it. <laughs> kind of exciting. <laughs> There's a lot of that in life. Yeah. It still somehow recall the elegance, the beauty of ancient days. Past midnight before the moon rises. Don't think it's strange to meet and not recognize 
and an old familiar face. Yet still somehow remember the elegance of ancient days. Ancient is timeless, it's that which is always here, that which understands we have always been here and weren't born and do not die. Which is a rather wonderful thing when we notice it. But at the moment we just sort of have a hint, an intuition of the ancient days. The beauty of things, the elegance of life. So just be confident in yourself and let things appear, whatever appears, without um, opposing yourself. Thinking you're experiencing the wrong thing.
Can we be comfortable there before we know anything? Don't think it's strange to meet, yet not recognize an old familiar face. And still somehow remember the elegance of ancient days. So whatever rises in your meditation somehow must be it, you know. It's a kind of, I don't know, it was a surprise when I realized that, <laughs> that, that, that the whole job of meditation was sweeping, cleaning the mirror, sweeping the mind away, getting calm. And it, it will have that effect, but that a sort of side effect, really. It's to meet the old familiar face. and somehow recall the elegance of ancient days. So we can tell that it must be all right now, even if I don't recognize <laughs> the ancient face. You know, it's okay. I recognize the face from long ago, you know, the familiar face. It's okay. What if that were true? What if now was not a burning ship you needed to abandon, but a welcoming glade. It's yours. It's the only now we have. <laughs> we, we might as well damn well enjoy it. You know, <laughs> it's like. <laughs> and sometimes it's kind of intense, but you know, it's real. You know. I must say, I kind of didn't. I sort of disapproved of people getting COVID and dropping out of the retreat. Not, not of them, but of, I, was, I found myself disapproving of reality, like, how dare it? And, and uh, we're having this wonderful retreat. And, uh, and then I was talking to one of the other teachers who's teaching there, and, and, uh, we, and, he, uh, and I said, you know, I'm beginning to enjoy this. It's kind of, we're not going to be able to do all the great things we normally plan and manage and, in the... And, uh, he said, yeah, it's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll, have to make, we'll have to make do. <laughs> and the people holding the retreat are all, they're of course all nervous and don't want to do us, all, us to do all these things we're just going to do anyway. But um, just because they're part of Sashin. But it's sort of rather, it's rather fun to think God knows how we'll pull this off. But I like it, you know. It's nice to have everything you know taken away. And still somehow recall the elegance of ancient days. You know. Still somehow recall the elegance of ancient days. So whatever your condition, uh, somebody just, I know, well, just sort of said that, you know, her back is bad and she's got to meditate lying down. And I thought, that's great. What a great thing to meditate lying down. You know. And it, it can be that, like I had a friend who, I said, well, I can't come to Sachin because I'm, I'm, he was dying of cancer, because I'm dying. And I said, well, what's wrong with dying at Sachin? And so we, <laughs> we, seemed like a good idea. And so we dragged his, a mattress in and we had a whole bunch of like uh, Zabatons laid out. And, and uh, you know, we did w walking meditation behind him while he's lying down and meditating. Seemed a successful thing to do. He didn't actually die in the session because um, one of his caretakers panicked and took him off to hospital to die, which seemed like, you know, that was it too. That was all right too. But yeah, where you are is, is probably at peace. So just to say that, you know, where you are is at peace. And it's for you. You know, the old uh, koan that somebody says, why must it be this way, contemplating like, I don't know, the Ukraine or frogs tear it being torn apart by crows or you know the, um, the, the difficulty of the world the genuine difficulty of the world and the old teacher said um, it's for you honored one and you, when he says honored one you can tell that 
Oh, you're the honored one. You're the person on the path. You're the bodhisattva walking the path. And so you need to respect your own life and whatever's given to you. <laughs> a couple of days ago, um, I had this blazing... Um, I woke up in the middle of the night with this blazing migraine-like headache and um, kind of impressive, I thought, you know. I was quite impressed by my headache, <laughs> and and, uh, and I thought, oh God, I'll never be able to do all these things I'm supposed to do tomorrow if I don't get all those thoughts cross through my mind, and and um, the all wrong thoughts wanted to sort of start to come up. It's all wrong. It, this is wrong, and and then I I realized that was foolish. So then I started bearing it. Then I realized that was foolish. You don't no need to bear your life, you know. And so then I just turned and went into the fire, and it didn't, it, it didn't, I don't know what happened then, but I became at peace with it. That's what happened. And that's what happens. If you but turn into the fire of your life, you'll be at peace with it. And, you know, <laughs> somebody once said to me, it's good enough for government work, you know. <laughs> it's like, that's what you can do, you know. And there are other kinds, and that's the, oh, you meet but don't recognize. It's all right not to recognize it at first, you know, and then it will gradually appear. There are other kinds about meeting the peach blossoms and getting enlightened, things like that, which are the blaze of things. And the second kind, actually, I'll, maybe I'll talk about the second kind of this next time. Uh, uh, second kind of this is about meeting waking up late, sleeping in, being very relaxed in that dark and waking up and then seeing, seeing the world, seeing the mirror of the world, which is the mirror of your mind. So, uh, But at the moment, every piece of the path is golden. If you're lost and confused, you can love that. You can turn into that. You can say, wow, isn't being lost better than being right <laughs> and things like that anyway they're fun you know so so that yeah that 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 still somehow recall the elegance of ancient days let's just sit a bit more with that you know enjoying if you're lost Enjoy it. Every time you discover something, in a way you're lost because what you knew previously isn't there. And so then it can be full of wonder. Awakening is, is in a way being lost to what you knew wasn't possible, what you knew, all those things. You know. How to do a retreat. <laughs> that sort of thing. Now we're finding out how to do a retreat. And each moment we're discovering you're discovering your own true face, like here, 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 here. And you notice it's never there, <laughs> it's always here. <laughs> and if you messed up, you have to turn into the messed up. And if you're full of wonder, then you don't need to turn into that because it's already here. You know? But you'll notice that the wonder and the being messed up are a different only only you know trying to shove one away and this, the effort of shoving life away is tremendously painful and distorting and makes those around us lonely so it's all right to have this life in all its impossibility don't think it's strange to meet and not recognize the other an old familiar face and still somehow recall, remember the elegance of ancient days. So I was thinking there's a, there's a time um, 
in meditation, if you really give yourself to a practice, uh, it'll immediately, your life will immediately feel somewhat clearer or more balanced or more something that you wanted. You know. And then, after a while, you feel like you're stuck. That's an inevitable stage. And uh, you may be much further along than that, but really, it just cycles back through because it's like we weren't born, we won't die, we're not stuck, we're not free. All those, the vastness of things is in everything, including. Uh, and if, so if you get stuck, in a way, it's a gift. It's for your benefit. So anyway, the getting stuck thing. And, um, and you notice that, but if you don't disapprove of that, you'll be okay. You know, if you don't disapprove of that, gradually you'll feel like the meditation is starting to carry you and you lose it and you feel like, wow, I'm getting somewhere and then the next day you're not getting anywhere at all. <laughs> but it carries you and you start to see. I remember, I remember seeing, um, I thought, wow, I understand this con. There's a con about somebody who's really stuck. It was a, a Buddha who sat who sat on the Buddha's personal seat for a thousand years, you know, quite a dedicated performance, and, uh, and still did not realize the way, did not realize uh, enlightenment did not appear. And uh, how is that? How is that? And some a student asked the teacher, how can that be? And the teacher said, because he is an unenlightened Buddha. And, and, and I thought, I... I get that, I get that. And I rushed into, it was during a retreat, and I rushed in to see my teacher and I said, you know that con about the unenlightened Buddha? I get it. And he said, okay, explain it, to tell me. And I couldn't say anything. <laughs> so it was good. I was still, that was the unenlightened Buddha. Yes. <laughs> still Buddha, but not quite aware of it yet. So you'll have those times when you're not really aware of it, but the glimpses you have are nonetheless that you do meet someone and the face does seem familiar and so that starts to carry you after a while. And then you'll notice, but still I'm not doing X, whatever X you think you need to do. I need all the teachers to hold this session properly, that sort of thing. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't need all those things to be peaceful or to have freedom in your mind, you know. There's nothing else you need. You have everything you need, so there is that. I want to read a, a, a couple of a couple of poems. Um, here's a funny little piece. Somebody who I thought was really good at meeting the world in a sort of rambunctious, difficult way was Jim Harrison, and um, the uh, and he's got this long poem. I, I, I lost the first part of it, so I'm just going to read. <laughs> I'm just going to. Jim Harrison would like that. I'm just going to read. Black stars in a grey sky and horses clattering in and out, our dead animals resting here and there, but often willing to come to life again, to greet us. Parents and brothers and sisters sit at the August table laughing while they eat twelve fresh vegetables from the garden. Rivers, creeks, lakes over which birds funnel like massive schools of minnows. In memory, the clocks have drowned themselves, leaving time to the lifespans of trees. The world of our lives comes unbidden as night. Now I'll read a couple of other things. Um, back when I was young and still alive, he's a very opinionated poet, but you know. Back when I was young and still alive, there are almost too many gods. You could see them ripple in the water before the lake's ice melted in April the loons and curlews giving them voice. Years ago, in a high green pasture near Timberline, I watched a small black bear on its back rolling back and forth and shimmying to scratch its back, pouring the air with pleasure, not likely wanting to be anywhere or anyone else. <laughs> So there you are, the bear can do it. <laughs> and here's a, here's a great uh, poet, a great English language poet, 
uh, this is Derek Walcott, Love After Love. And in a way, this is about the experience of looking in the mirror, the mirror of life, that everything you see is mirror, is mirror, you know. The day will come when with elation you greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You'll love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, Peel your image, your own image, from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. And you can feel that starting to happen, that you're having your own life and it's returning to you and you're sinking into it in the meditation. And you can feel that whether you recognize the old familiar face or not. And you start to feel, hang on, that old familiar face is what I see in the mirror my own true face. Let me, I don't know, let me ask maybe a couple of people to comment, um, because in a way we, we have, I mean, just to say there's one great, it's like the stars in the night sky and we're all linked and everybody has their own light. So I ask other people to speak. Alison Atwell, you'd be a good person to start with, or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, I was thinking of that quote that you said, Aiken and uh, Yamada Cohen would always say to you that awakening is forgetting the self in the act of encountering something. And uh, we've got this apricot tree that this year, for some mysterious reason, has had almost a biblical amount of um, produced a biblical amount of apricots and so they've all become ripe just as we're heading into session and I've got a million things to do and uh, we've got John's daughter here and she is this athletic person who likes to you know run up the rat lines of, sh of big ships and so she's up there just picking all the apricots we've got these bags and bags of them and I love apricot jam so I a couple of days ago I made my first batch of jam it's only got three ingredients it's just got apricots sugar and Meyer lemon juice and the first batch was um, uh, some kind of ambrosia from the guys like everything was perfect and I started to think, um, you know, I started to imagine giving these jars of jam to special people and they would think so well of me <laughs> that I would be an important person, you know, sort of raised myself in my own imagination. And um, the self was getting inflated. And, um, <laughs> and then I made the second batch of jam and I, I got ambitious and plus the apricots were piling up so I made this huge pot and it was really late at night and I was pouring in the sugar and I forgot how many apricots how many cups of apricots I'd put in and I forgot how much sugar I'd put in and I had this bad feeling that I'd I'd gotten the um, proportions wrong and I was just too tired to work it out. I thought, oh God, I can't like take all the sugar out of the pot and try to measure it again. And so I just went on with it. I mean, jar after jar of jam. And the second batch, I tasted it and I thought, something's not right. So I I did a taste test with my with um, John's daughter where we had that the old batch and the new batch. We took a bite of the new new batch, seemed like really good, but then we took the old batch and it was so much better, like our hearts just plummeted. <laughs> and I thought, I don't want 
people to know that I made the second batch. And uh, I remembered this, you know, the self was, again, they'll think badly of me. And then I made the third batch last night. <laughs> and, and I started making the fourth batch this morning before. And there's, at this point, there's just, each apricot is so, um, uh, is this kind of direct encounter with the color orange and the fragrance and the, the feel of the um, knife cutting through the fruit and the sound of the pit dropping into the metal bowl. And uh, I just feel like I could make jam into eternity. And uh, it's just a pleasure encountering apricots. Well, thank you. I look forward to tasting some of this. <laughs> um, Karen Fluger, do you want to say anything? It's nice to not tell people you're going to ask them. How to tell when you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I, I, I think the only thing really coming up is the notion of being in the dark before the moon comes up, and how I enjoyed enjoyed that place and um, felt like I could had that feeling of being able to be there forever, not needing the moon to come up didn't have to be different. So just the, the, the velvety feeling of being a creature in the dark. Thank you. Jordan McConnell, you play so eloquently, but and I'm, I always like what you say, I hear you say something, so <laughs> anything to say? <laughs> um. One thing that I'm learning playing music in this setting is, um, or one thing I'm finding is that the piece, the pieces that I'm playing, well, not really pieces, the whatever I end up playing in the moment, um, I'm finding it's slowing down a lot, and there's a lot more space, <clears throat> um, and I'm noticing how beautiful each individual note can be not necessarily uh, not because I played it perfectly or anything like that but just how this thing can sort of hang in the air and just be its own thing in that in that one space just right there um, and so I think that is I'm experiencing a, a instead of thinking in long melody lines and some whole thing is this one piece of music um, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, like directly encountering each note as it's there. Um, and I'm really enjoying just leaving them sitting there to kind of do their thing for a while. Thanks. I'm enjoying that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad Thank to you, hear it. <laughs> um, there's someone I want here. Um, Chris Gaffney, are you, do you have anything you'd like to say about, I don't know, past midnight before the moon rises? Yeah, I was thinking I wanted a jar of that second batch of apricot jam. That was one thing. I was uh, thinking about extremophiles because I was reading about, you know, these little creatures that live down in the vents and down inside the earth and that that's where we all came from. It all got started down there in the dark. So <clears throat> that and uh, that quote from Yamada about um, in Aitken about forgetting the self and uniting with something else. And that got me to thinking about, because <clears throat> I'm reading this book, Rare Earth, about tissue. And tissue is when the cells that are there, the inner cell communication is great enough that they sort of, for, 
they just forget themselves and they become <laughs> part of something greater. So, and I was thinking that while I was watching Jordan and listening to Jordan play and then some sort of, you know, boundaries coming down or still there, but very intense communication. So that's what I was thinking about. Thank you, Chris. Backstory with that with Yamada, because he was somebody who'd had quite a number of a long meditation practice and was very close to great, even when he was a, and he lived his whole life like his wife was a famous physician and he, he ran a sort of clinic and hospital system that she was the medical director of. And um, his whole life he did that, but he always yearned to understand more about Zen. And then one day coming back from a session, the teacher had taught, um, Yastani had taught this thing about Mount Amazu saying, mountains, rivers, and the great earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and no other than your own heart mind. And, uh, you know, you might have coming back on the train felt like being carried and you know, the meditation was starting to carry him and he was meditating on the train and coming home from Sashin and that was fine. He thought, I could achieve lots of things, you know. And then he went to bed and then in the middle of the night he woke up shouting, I know what it means, I know what it's all about and laughing. And then he realized his family had come in to look at him and were very concerned. <laughs> they thought he'd gone mad. But that was it. So he did unite with the mountains, rivers, and the great earth, the sun, the moon, and the stars, you know, and had that feeling about him. And you always, when you talk to him, you always knew he understood that, you know. It was, he didn't have to say anything. You just could understand. In, and you can feel that in your own being, you might, you know, you can understand that you have a part in this great mystery, and in fact, it's completed in you. So, just to say that, and if you don't know what that means, remember, it's past midnight and the moon hasn't risen, and that's all right. <laughs> but it might sound a bit familiar. Let's do a little more sinning. Past midnight before the moon rises. Don't think it strange to meet and not recognize an old familiar face. Yet still somehow recall the elegance of ancient times. And just, you know, just let the meditation come to you and um, whatever is happening is that's it, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you mean this is it? Yes, I do. <laughs> that's it. And just feel the fullness in the dark, the fullness of that. It's a, a, a noble condition. Meditation actually carries us, is one way to put it, and the koan embraces us.
the third watch begins past midnight before the moon rises before the old moon sheds its light in the darkest part of night past midnight before the moon rises don't think it's strange to me to not recognize an old familiar face and still at the same time remember have a feeling for the elegance of ancient days that you're in the presence of that beauty and elegance even when you don't know yet still somehow remember the beauty of ancient days and just let you know let the meditation carry you really isn't to be at peace to be at peace on the earth to be at peace in the times we have, still somehow recall the elegance of ancient days. And just feel the meditation um, <clears throat> that this, the meditation is a time when we can see the elegance of ancient days and we can feel it as holding us it's within our hearts and minds as well. And perhaps our anxiety can just come to rest. Our anxiety to find the next thing or to move on to something that will solve whatever we think our problem is. But from the point of view of the koan, here is the right place to be. Here, <laughs> and again here. Here's, um, here's Milosh, Milosh, um, kind of, um, probably translated by Robert Haas, but not, I'm not sure about this one. It's called On Angels, and it's those moments of glimpsing the old familiar face, and it doesn't really go further than that, but um, it's kind of nice to know that you can get glimpses, you know. Not the worst thing. <laughs> On angels. All was taken away from you. White dresses, wings, even existence. Yet I believe you, messengers. There where the world is turned inside out, a heavy fabric embroidered with stars and beasts. You stroll inspecting the trustworthy seams. Short is your stay here, now, now and then at a matinal hour, if the sky is clear, in a melody repeated by a bird. Or in the smell of apples at the close of day, when the light makes the orchards magic. They say somebody has invented you, but to me this does not sound convincing. <laughs> for the humans invented themselves as well. The voice, no doubt it is a valid proof, as it can belong only to radiant creatures, weightless and winged, after all, why not? Girdled with lightning. I have heard that voice many a time when asleep, and what is strange, I understood more or less an order or an appeal in an, in an unearthly tongue. Day draws near, another one, do what you can. He had a good sense, you know, his life was 
um, swirled around by the great, you know, a number of the great disasters of the 20th century. And so when he says, do what you can, <laughs> I kind of believe him <laughs> that he did that. And we can, on the hardest day, we can do what we can, you know. And that feeling of like, oh, maybe it's in the smell of apples at evening. Maybe, maybe it's in the taste of the second batch of apricot jam that wasn't quite as good as the first. <laughs> a result of a very unzen like lapse of attention. So that kind of thing. And then you realize, oh, that's delightful too, you know. That's delightful too.
Well, thank you, everyone. It's splendid to see you. <laughs> and thanks very much for coming. And, and you know, um, we like people to become members, so if you can go online and become a member, we would think that was thrilling. <laughs> so, you know, and we have a low bar because we kind of want the community, uh, so we want you to be able to join. And uh, we want a community that creates a culture for awakening, is what our, our goal is. And if you have money and can give us money, it keeps the, the wheels turning. So we're for that, and thank you if you have done that. And, and so, and uh, otherwise, thank you for coming. It's, it's, we're all holding this great, uh, you know, the net of Indra is the, the jewels, the whole universe is a bunch of jewels reflecting each other. So that's what we hold in the temple. So thank you very much. And, uh, and perhaps I'll see you in two weeks when I'll be back. Thank you.